participants that cannot attend. Okay. <clears throat> Hazuki, uh, when you want, you, you can allow everybody in. Okay, um, yeah, it is 4.30, so I'm going to admit everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar, everyone. I'd like to wait maybe two more minutes because I see a lot of um, people coming in. So we will start the webinar in two minutes. Thank you. Good morning, good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining our webinar today on Ask a Winner. This is one of the webinars on the series we are doing for the Access to Space for All initiative, and it is our pleasure to have you here. My name is Hazuki Mori of the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Before we give in, I'd like to first talk about logistics. So, first of all, I'd like everyone to turn off your cameras and microphones. I want all the speakers to be able to show their um, faces on their cameras and just use their microphones. So to all the people who are joining in, please make sure to keep your cameras off and your microphones on, uh, microphones off, sorry, <laughs> make sure they're all off. And second, um, we have a chat. So please, if you have any questions or comments, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So please make sure to write in your questions and uh, comments there. And third, in the chat we will put a link to the questionnaire form so please make sure to answer the questionnaire form before you leave the webinar in the questionnaire form we will ask 
um, about the ratings of the webinars and we will also ask for your email address if you are interested and you can sign up and we will send you um, information about webinars and activities that our office will be doing so yes please make sure to answer the questionnaire form for us okay Next here is the agenda for today. We have three remarks from the different permanent missions in Vienna. We have the permanent mission from Costa Rica, Jordan, and Kenya. After that, my colleague Jorge will explain about the Access to Space for All initiative, which we are doing in the office right now. And after that, we will have the exciting part, which is bringing in the past winners of our program. So first, we will have Nabil Ayub from Jordan. He is our first round winner of Drop Test. Second, we will have Agota Simon. She is the fifth round winner of Drop Test and from Romania. Third, we will have Victor Hugo Ajardi Bardales, who is from Guatemala, who is the Kibo Cube second round winner. Fourth, we will have Merlin Renan Kul. Um, he is the first round winner of the Chinese Space Station Opportunity, and his team is from Switzerland, Germany, and China. And last but not least, we will have Trisha Lynn Luis LaRose, um, who is also a first round winner of the Chinese Space Station Opportunity, and this team is from Norway, France, the Netherlands, and Belgium. And at the end, we will have a roundtable Q&A with the winners. So as I mentioned earlier, please make sure to write in your questions and comments in the chat, and we will answer them all in the end. Okay, so now I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, who is Miss, um, who is the permanent mission, who is the ambassador of the permanent mission of Costa Rica, His Excellency Alejandro Solano Ortiz. Mr. Ortiz, you have the floor. Thank you very much. As I was said, uh, I want to thank Munoza for convening this webinar and uh, inviting me. In order to, to share the national experience and views on the access to space for all initiatives. Basic principle in the space related activities is the full access for the states with an approach of knowledge and technology sharing. Let me share some activities where Costa Rica has been involved in cooperation under this initiative. In 2016, the Technological Institute of Costa Rica won the access to the fellowship program drop tower experiment. This tower, located in Germany, is a ground-based laboratory with a drop top of a height of 146 meters. And in that time, our students had the opportunity to expand the technological knowledge and information on the behavior of robotic arm manipulator, such as dynamics, motion, and control under microgravity conditions. Also, just recently, we have submitted the interest to NOSA to receive the Dream Chaser Space Bay. With the Technological Institute and the national authorities, several studies have been developed in order to offer the participants of the orbital space mission, the airport of Liberia in the North Pacific in Costa Rica, for the landing of the vehicle. This airport has all the conditions to be part of the initiative. Costa Rica was the first Central American country to launch a satellite into space. And since then, our national experts are working in preparing the second satellite, uh, the, as well as in providing technical assistance through partnership in different universities to the Central American regions. And now this is the case. I'm really proud of Central American project and that the umbrella of the Central American integration system has been selected. The launch of a new satellite in 2021 with the aim to provide geospace information would be very useful to foster the resilience capacity of our region, one of the most vulnerable by the climate change in the world. In this context, I want to thank JAXA, Japanese Aerospace Agency, and UNOSA in the scope of the Cuba Coup program for this opportunity. Important to highlight that this is the first time an international organization, the project involves academical institutions of Honduras, Guatemala, and the University of Costa Rica and the Federal Professional Society of Engineers and Architects of Costa Rica, coordinated by our national expert and good friends, Carlos Alvarado. 
This project will allow to our region use technological tools in order to promote the SDGs. The space has and will have huge implications in our development. Through the space use, the humanity will benefit in many areas. In itself, the use of the space science and technology will be essential and fundamental for the benefits of all humankind. Let me conclude with a phrase of our astronaut Franklin Chan, who said, no one gets anywhere without the help of someone else. Recognitions to UNOSA and JAXA for supporting this initiative. I thank you. Thank you so much to His Ex Excellency Alejandro Solano Ortiz. Next, I would like to introduce you to the Second Secretary of the Permanent Mission of Jordan, Mr. Essam Al Ragad. Mr. Essam, you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Mori. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to extend on behalf of my embassy and my ambassador, I would like to thank you, Ms. Mori and Mr. George, as well as the United Nations uh, for Space uh, UNUSA for conducting this, this webinar. It's indeed a great opportunity to participate in, in this uh, event where we can learn and where, where we can also exchange views on an important uh, topic. Such uh, initiatives over, uh, are very important uh, for capacity building, especially from, uh, from uh, our area uh, Jordan and the Middle East. I also would like to congratulate our team from Jordan uh, on this achievement and uh, we wish them all the best and, uh, and all success in the future. And uh, also we're looking forward for more innovative uh, people and participants uh, from uh, Jordan. Uh, again, I apologize for not attending uh, the first session in the morning. And I extend also uh, the ambassador's uh, greetings and regards uh, 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 to yourselves and uh, looking forward to hear from our team about their achievement and their project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Alvaragad. It is a pleasure to have you here. And Next, I'd like to introduce you to our third speaker, who is the second counselor of the permanent mission of Kenya, Mr. Glenn's T.E. Etnyang. Mr. Etnyang, you have the floor. Um, I think we're having some technical issues right now, so um, I'd like to bring this to a later part of the session. So next, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Jorge Rio de Rivera. He will explain to you about the Access to Space for All initiative. Jorge, you have the floor. Thank you very much, um, Hasuki, for uh, for the introduction. Really, really a pleasure here. Let me share my screen. I hope you can see it now. Uh, thank you also to the to the previous speakers from the permanent mission of uh, Costa Rica and uh, the permanent mission of uh, Jordan. It's it's really an honor to have you here and, and thank you very much for your insightful remarks and, and the support to the, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Um, good day or, or good night, depending on, on where you are. Thank you for joining us today. We have put a lot of effort in making an attractive program for you today and, and uh, definitely we hope that you're enjoying it. I'm Jorge del Rio Vera, and I'm going to present uh, the Access to Space for All initiative. First, I would like to step a little bit back and, uh, and give you a little bit of context of the initiative. So, UNUSA, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, is the UN dedicated space entity that provides services on the legal, policy, and technical side of space activities. 
we are also, as the, as the UN dedicated entity uh, for space, we are uh, helping bring and establish an, an emerging space ferry nation together on an equal setting and uh, for mutual interest. And the access to space for all initiative is a testimony of that. And, and you will see that in a minute. Well, access to space for all. Um, I want to start with a question to, to all of you. Why should you care? Why is it important? Is it really important? Well, uh, let's start the, the conversation with a few facts. Um, there you can see in the, in the screen the value of a space economy. The value of a space economy today is between 350 and 425 billion US dollars. However, in 2040, it is expected that the value of space economy will be between 1 trillion and 3 trillion US dollars. That's a high upward trend that you have in there. In addition, the last year in 2019, space employment hit an eight-year high uh, in, in, in numbers, in number of people that is employed by the space sector. Also, um, Last year, there was a 39% growth, if you consider the whole uh, past decade, in launch activities. And last year, there were an average of two launches per week, roughly, a little bit less than that. I mean, if you think about several years, like a couple of decades ago, space launch was normally hitting the, the prime time news. Today, it's almost an everyday thing. And this gives you an idea of the magnitude of how space sector is becoming so natural and so, so, so easy to access. There are 95 countries in, in, that are members of the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, COPWAS, and not all of them have put a satellite in orbit. Actually, there are uh, more than 80 countries that have put a satellite in orbit, and that, that, that number is, is growing. And out of those plus 80 countries that have put a satellite in orbit, two of them have put a satellite in orbit thanks to one of the programs of the Office for Outer Space Affairs in cooperation with JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, which is called KIBOQ, Kini and Guatemala. And you will hear more today about Kini and Guatemala. Um, I mean, still the, the question remains, I mean, why, why, why should you care? This, this economy, but what, what is space doing for a sustainable society. Well, let's go one step further. The sustainable development goals, the 17 sustainable development goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I'm sure you have heard about them. If you have not heard about them, it means that you have not applied to an opportunity under Access to Space for All recently because we are asking in the applicants are putting a link between the experiment that they want to run or the satellite that they want to launch into space and the sustainable development goals. Um, so that links assist and we can demonstrate and show how space is benefiting society through the sustainable development goals. If you look at the agenda, there are the 70 sustainable development goals, but below that, the agenda is underpinned by a number of targets. 169 targets are supporting the agenda and below that there are 231 indicators that are helping to monitor the achievement of the agenda. In the office, we are fully committed to supporting this, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and we have specific programs that are supporting different of the of different sustainable development goals. But above all, we are supporting sustainable development goal number four, quality education, because the office is supporting uh, member states in building capacity. And access to space for all is not an exception. If you are looking at the sustainable development goal number four, under that, as I mentioned before, there are targets. So one of the targets is the one that you have in, the, in your screen. By 2030, sub substantially increase the number of youth and adults who have relevant skills, including technical skills. And that's where access to space for all comes into play. And probably now you're asking yourself, what is this access to space for uh, for all all about? Well, it's it's a very very simple answer. In the office, we have been working a lot to provide capacity building 
uh, support uh, to member states and to institutions in member states related to space activities, space policy, uh, space law and space data technology and applications. We have been doing that for almost 50 years now. There was a program of space application that was established in 1971. We will be celebrating the 50 years next year. And that program was exactly for that, for furthering the knowledge and exchange knowledge on space applications. We saw also about 10 years ago that there was an increased interest in hands-on opportunities. That's why uh, we were offering more and more of these opportunities and two years ago we created we created access to space for all the access to space for all initiative and that initiative is to provide hands-on opportunities to access research facilities and, and infrastructure that otherwise it will be either too costly or too difficult to access for some countries so this is why access to space for all is important it's not only about the theoretical part that the office is providing this particular program is about providing hands-on opportunities and creating an A to Z capacity. So we are helping countries from, to go from A to Z in terms of capacity development in different areas. And we are also helping countries to build that capacity in a sustainable and responsible manner. And this initiative is interlinked with other activities that we are running in the office. I mean, it's, it's not working in isolation. We have many different activities where you can start your, your journey into utilizing a space. Uh, in, in, the, in the slide, you have several of the initiatives that, uh, that we have in the office, and you have several uh, sustainable development goals that are highlighted. You have a space economy, for instance. We were running a series of webinars this summer on a space economy. <clears throat> Uh, a space economy to extract the benefits of a space to, to, to the economy is really important. But in order to do that, you have to have an equal level playing field that generates security for investment. And that's something that you can create through the, the implementation of national space law and, and, and policy. And that's something that we do also in the office through the new, through the space law for new space actors. Uh, project that, that we have and that project is closely related to access to space for all. Uh, <clears throat> the, the national space law and policy that is put uh, into work uh, thanks to this program that, that is supported by this program in a country can be put into work in a practical manner by, by the different opportunities that we have under access to space for all. So the, the theoretical framework or the national po policy and, and, and regulations framework can be uh, experienced in a hands-on way using uh, access to space for all, uh, opportunity, but vice versa, access to space for all opportunity. There are some opportunities that help you to get acquainted with international space law and, and guidelines. And that first contact can stimulate the creation of national space law that can be supported by the space law for new space actors project of the office. And we are doing all that and we are supporting uh, other societal aspects. We are supporting space society. We have projects that are, are space for women to encourage the participation of women into space activities. We have another project that is called space for youth, which is stimulating the participation of youth in uh, space activities. And access to space for all encouraging that participation. We are highly encouraging the participation of women and, and youth in the program to the point that having an inclusive team is a selection criteria. We are valuing very positively that, that there is an inclusive team that is taking part in the opportunity and that provides extra points. So how does the initiative look like? There in the screen, you have the three different tracks in which the initiative is divided today. Um, if, if you look there, there are blue dots and, and, and red dots or red donuts in each of the different tracks. And actually the exploration track has only, only red donuts. <clears throat> the tracks are, def are defined to build capacity from A to Z in an incremental manner 
gradually acquiring that capacity. For instance, if we take the hypergravity and microgravity track, we have opportunities in ground, which are easier uh, uh, to run experiments there. And then you can move gradually into orbit and we have opportunities in orbit. We have a, a cooperation with Airbus on Bartolomeu, which is a platform that is installed in the outside of the International Space Station. Sorry, we uh, we have a cooperation with the China Man Space Agency on the on the Chinese space station, which is upcoming. We have a cooperation with Sierra Nevada Corporation on on the utilization of the Dream Chaser. So, so as you can see, we we have opportunities in ground, we have opportunities in orbit, and there is a red dot in the middle. It's because we consider that we are missing a step in this gradual ladder leading to the capacity that we want to develop, which is being able to develop payloads in microgravity in orbit. And we are actively working in getting new partners to fill in those gaps and, and, uh, and providing the full track and gradual track of opportunities. And I said before, sustainable and responsible capacity. Well, sustainable capacity is because these are not opportunities that are working in isolation. It's not a program that you go to an opportunity and then it's over and you don't know what to do anymore. You have tracks, so you ha you know where to start and where is the goal. You can start with an opportunity. You start with that opportunity and then when that's over, you have already the skill belonging to that opportunity. You can go to the next opportunity and gradually escalate your capabilities to get the final capability that you are looking for. In the particular case of the hypergravity and microgravity track would be, as I said, to put uh, experiment in orbit uh, in microgravity. We cannot do this without partners, and that's why you see many different logos in the slide. We in the office, we don't own any infrastructure. We don't have any facility that you can access, and, and we are cooperating together with um, research institutes, space agencies, and, and private industry to provide these opportunities uh, free of charge to you. <clears throat> If you want to uh, to know what's what's open right now, well, we have an opportunity that is currently open, uh, which is the opportunity of the deploying a 3U CubeSat into orbit, which is accessing space with Vegasy, and the opportunity closes on the 4th of April 2021. On top of that, we are also uh, organizing a series of webinars, and the, the, the webinar we are in is, is an example of that, to help building successful applications and we are putting all that material accessible online, so you can actually revisit when you are building your application. We have the, the, the webinar of today as a winner. We will have a webinar next week about artificial intelligence and access to space for all, and we are planning others exactly to help you developing the, the application. In addition to that, we have webinars devoted to the individual opportunities. We had one on drop tests last week, uh, and we have also other webinars that are related to other opportunities that are not access to space for all, part of the access to space for all initiative because they are no hands-on opportunities. But for instance, the, the introduction to the postgraduate study on nanosatellite technologies fellowship program, it's an opportunity that we have with the university, well, the, the Kyushu Institute of Technology in Japan, which is a, a renowned university. And in there, you have the opportunity for those who want to pursue engineering studies and, and learn how to build satellites to get a full uh, full blown scholarship free of charge uh, and and we will have a webinar on that on that uh, on the 7th of, of December so as you see that there are many pieces of the puzzle that are to actually capacity if we go at the activities that we have been running this year despite the covid 19 pandemic we have continued carrying out the, the, the program, the Access to Space for All initiative. And you see that there, the, the people that won job tests this year, the, the Universidad Católica Boliviana La Paz, uh, that are working in a extruder, a 3D printer that utilizes a novel technique that only works in microgravity. And they are developing this extruder right now as we speak. That team uh, that you, you see there in the, in the, in the picture, has been also involved in the development on a low cost 
of a low-cost ventilator that is helping Bolivia to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm not claiming that this is because of drop tests. What I'm saying is that these opportunities that are under Access to Space for All are allowing you to develop skills that are transversal. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, all those skills can be utilized for winning an opportunity, which, I mean, means already that you are very skilled and you are winning a, a, an international competition, and put those skills to work to something different. In the particular case of, uh, of Bolivia, they build a, a low-cost ventilator for the COVID-19 pandemic. It's, it's, uh, it's really a wonderful example. We also had, and we will have uh, um, Victor Ayerdi from, uh, from Guatemala, uh, the, the launch of the, of the Guatemalan satellite Quetzal-1 that happened this year in April. The satellite has been already six months in orbit. And there you have in the screen uh, a graph on the decay on the satellite. I was mentioning before, sustainable and responsible uh, capabilities into access in space. We are very much concerned about space debris and the space debris mitigation guidelines and the guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space activities are very important for us. I mean, we don't consider those as guidelines. We are asking the participants in the different opportunities to actually implement those. And we want to see that implementation. I mean, the, the example of the of the Kibo Cube uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of, of uh, Guatemala is a great example. They are learning about orbital decay thanks to the data that they are gathering from this uh, CubeSat. And, 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 and that's, that graph is the proof for it. And that knowledge can be used in future satellites in the country, helping implementing, as I said, responsible behavior in the utilization of other space activities. So all this is connected. Um, I, I like to ask you, and I jump on one slide, I would like to ask you to, to help us and to help us in a very simple manner. We want that these opportunities are reaching those who can benefit from it. And we are heavily working in, in, in doing that, but we will need your help. We need your help to do that. And to help us helping those who can apply, uh, I would like to ask you to use the, the Axe uh, Space for All hashtag in, in your social media so people can easily relate that to the work of the office and uh, can spread the voice and, and can help uh, people to apply to, to, the, to the different opportunities that we have and their access to Space for All. I have been talking about <clears throat> social benefits, I have been talking about economic benefits, but I, I was saving one, one benefit for the, for the last. And that is the, the, the inspirational benefit. And that benefit is equally important. I have uh, Anis, and she's, she's going to turn seven uh, in January next, next year, uh, the coming January. And uh, I was visiting uh, uh, my brother and, and her in, in January this year. And, and she's very active. She, she likes to do a lot of things. And, She's asking Uncle Jorge, can, let's let let me show you this. Let 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 me show you what I learn in the schools. Let's let's play. And there I take the opportunity, and I have done uh, several times. And I say, okay, let's play. Let's play astronauts. And she immediately reacts to that. And that's in her imagination. And that's in the imagination of every kid. If you try that with every, they will react and they will react. And, and relate to something that they know. Space has that inspirational aspect of sparking imagination. And access to space for all is helping that. How? By providing the opportunity of having role models actually in the country. So those kids don't have to look to other countries to say, okay, well, yeah, there is a country down there that has put the satellite in orbit, and I would like to do the same. No, 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 no. The examples would be in the in the same country, and that has a lot of inspirational uh, capacity. It's already it's already there. It's just sparking it more, and from sparking the imagination of a little kid to think about space and to actually build a satellite, run an experiment in microgravity, is just 
a few years away. And access to space for all is helping in some countries to provide those role models so that imagination can be sparked even in, in, a, in a stronger way. Help us bring in the, the economic, the social and inspirational benefits of space down to earth and, and back to space. If you can directly support the office, please help us. If you cannot directly help uh, the office, please help us help by spreading the voice uh, about the opportunities so they reach those who can benefit from them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jorge. I hope all of you um, understand our initiative better. And I've posted some links on the chat. If you're interested in all the opportunities, you can find it on our website at unusa.org. So um, I'd like to move on to the lightning session of the speakers from the past, um, the past winners. So um, first, I'd like to introduce you to our drop test first round winner from Jordan, who is Nabil Ayub. Nabil, you have the floor. Thank you. I'll share it in a minute. Well, Nabil shares. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please make sure to put it in the chat. We will have a Q&A at the end of the session and try to answer all your questions. And I really appreciate all the questions that are coming in. I will definitely answer them at the end. OK, thank you, Nabil. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, well, as uh, Azuki said, uh, good morning, good evening. Depends where you are in this world. Well, we were the first uh, round winners of drop test, uh, and uh, that was in 2014. And uh, at that time, uh, I was at the German Jordanian University. I was a dean of the graduate studies. And I had a team of three students, Farah Hatur, Ghais Shishani, and Hisham Wani. We uh, applied uh, for the competition. And uh, lo and behold, we won the competition. And we went to uh, UNUSA. Uh, we went to uh, Tsarm, uh, which is in Bremen. It's a drop tower, uh, tower uh, test facility. Uh, it has a height of 146 meter, and the active part, the free fall part, is 120 meters. If you look at the simple equation of h equals half gt squared, you can directly calculate the time of free fall, which is uh, less, just less than five seconds. So any uh, phenomena that we shall study has to occur within that time window of less than five seconds. Uh, in the figure below, uh, the, this is the team. Uh, we have uh, Thorben Kuhneman, uh, who is the uh, mentor, and he was uh, the uh, chief uh, engineer there uh, looking after the facility. In addition, we have the engineering team. I have the students with me, and I have the representative of UNUSA, uh, Mr. Miyoshi. Now, how did this idea came about? Well, one of our students, Farah Hatur, she's a team member, found out about it through the Deanship of uh, Student Affairs at the German Jordanian University, in which they knew about the opportunity through the Royal Jordanian Geographic Center. So it was all through the uh, Royal Geographic uh, Jordanian Center and they told us uh, about this opportunity where UNUSA shared the competition. Then uh, came uh, Farah with the idea and with another two students, and the idea was as follows. Uh, the idea of the project was about investigating whether a tuned mass damper can be used to, in order to reduce the unwanted instabilities of an electrodynamic tether, which is a long conductor wire that is attached to the satellite. It can act as a generator or motor from its motion through the Earth's magnetic field. Since the satellite experienced before the microgravity environment was needed in order to test the experimental outcome. Of course, in this case, 
The whole idea is that the tether, in this case, the very thin wire, which is suspended from the satellite, as it navigates over the Earth, uh, in the Earth orbit, it will pass through the electromagnetic field of the Earth. In this case, you will have a Lorentz force on the wire. This Lorentz force will not be a uniform force. It will change from one place to another on the uh, in the orbit. Correspondingly, the uh, fin, the tether, will uh, be subjected to all kinds of different forces, and therefore there will be wobbling and there will be oscillations. And these are uh, are very much unwanted oscillations that may deorbit the satellite. So Farah and the team came up with the idea, why not to use uh, the uh, tune mass damper in German, Schwinung Stilger. And uh, we, uh, uh, she came to me, she said, I went to so many other faculty members. They said, well, it's a far-fetched idea. She came to me, we talked about it, and then I told her as long as it doesn't violate the laws of nature, the laws of physics, everything is possible. And indeed, when I looked at the idea, it looks very plausible, and uh, I agreed to mentor the project. Now, uh, how uh, has participating in drop tests changed the environment? Well, after this participation in 2014, one of the team members, Reis Shishani, is a, uh, our team member. He gave a small talk at the Jordanian Astronomical Society. And we heard that there were uh, other teams from Jordan who are very much interested in participating in the drop test com competition. Here uh, you have uh, various uh, pictures from uh, December 2014, after we have done our uh, uh, visit to Bremen and uh, have done the experiments. Here uh, he is, uh, Raif is delivering his lecture. Then here we have the committee uh, members of the uh, Jordan Astronomical Society. And then here we have various uh, audience, they are, as you see, youth coming from all over Amman. Then how, again, uh, did this uh, participation change the environment around us? As a result of our participation in the drop test 2014, I pursued various UNUSA activities. In March 2016, I was invited to the United Nations Costa Rica workshop on human space technology. At that meeting, I was introduced to the Kleinostat device. In that meeting, I spoke about our experience and uh, our work at TSARM, at the drop test uh, facility. Uh, and here, I would like to thank very much the uh, representative of uh, the Embassy of Costa Rica for their generous uh, hospitality in addition uh, to UNUSA uh, for their uh, support uh, all the way. At that meeting, uh, I discovered a device called Kleinostat. The Kleinostat is a very simple uh, device that uh, simulates microgravity. And it has a huge potential in uh, many other fields uh, that I contemplated about uh, carrying uh, it to uh to jordan uh, and to uh, to uh, german jordanian university however in 2017 i was elected to be president of the american university of madaba in jordan in uh, that month we started a project on innovation and indeed i thought about the Kleinostat, and i thought why not to uh, carry this out in uh, the American University of Madam. Now, this innovation project we started for high school uh, students in Jordan to raise awareness about uh, outer space affairs and about <clears throat> various activities uh, in science, in the various fields of science, biology, physics, chemistry, mathematics, 
uh, geology, and so on. Well, uh, again, how did this uh, affect us? Uh, I come back to the climostat story. Uh, UNUSA at that time was uh, donating about 50 such uh, devices. However, when I, contact, I contacted uh, Mr. Miyoshi, he told me we ran out of stock of all of these. I looked at the international market. It was costing around $2,000. Then I thought, why not that we manufacture it uh, ourselves in the workshops of the American University of Madhav? And indeed, we have done that. We went through this. And as you see, this is the picture of a three-dimensional uh, clinostat. We have done it. And we started all kinds of experiments on it. And indeed, we were very lucky to get very uh, uh, strange results uh, when we uh, looked at the roots of uh, wheat, of the wheat plant, and we found that under uh, simulated microgravity, the roots would grow 2.5 times more than under uh, normal conditions under gravity. It was a very strange result. Again, uh, we went with these uh, ideas, with the climostat and uh, other uh, scientific ideas to the high school students. Uh, in particular, we went to the uh, King Abdullah II uh, excellent schools in Madaba, and uh, we have chosen many teams there, at least two teams of those that we have chosen. One of them won the uh, Ministry of the Jordanian Ministry of Education competition, and they were able uh, to uh, be eligible to go to the United States. And indeed, they went to the United States and uh, they have uh, subscribed with the International Science and Engineering Fair, and they won third place in space sciences. Uh, and this is a, a photo of the three young ladies. Now, uh, again, uh, as an offshoot of this participation in drop test uh, competition, in 2018, uh, I was invited by, again, UNUSA to the United Nations expert meeting on uh, human uh, space technology. You can see a photo here at the bottom uh, right uh, corner. And uh, in 2019, I was again invited to NASA for a 2019 Cross-Industry Innovation Summit to speak about the innovation initiative at the American University of Madama. So you can see the many opportunities that participating with the drop test has opened. Now, hopes for the future. We are drafting a strategic plan so that we can uh, launch various projects for AUM researchers and students to get involved in simulated microgravity experiments. In addition, AUM will reach out to more high school students for outer space awareness and to mentor them on forming teams and get involved in the effect of microgravity on specific phenomena that the students may propose to study. Two projects are being executed right now. Now we are uh, assembling a lab on wheels for the high school students. And another uh, project that we already started, this is about constructing 3D printers in collaboration with Gannon University in the USA. And indeed, we went to several schools uh, in the Madaba area and in Amman with the 3D printers. Now, uh, issues and obstacles during the program, the team started designing the and executing the project at GGU in 2014. The free fall time in SARM drop tower is around five seconds, as I said earlier. So the tune mass damper should act within this time frame. However, the best time we were able to reach was of the order of 50 seconds due to friction issues with our local use components. We communicated this fact to Professor Thorben Koneman of SARM, and he indeed immediately helped us uh, with practical solution and sent us a whole new setup of SARM at the expense of SARM. 
it was a great setup, uh, as you can see it. And we were able to reduce the, uh, the requested uh, time for the tune mass sample to act from 50 seconds into around 4.2 seconds. Again, some success stories. Farah Atour, Atour, one of the uh, drop test winners, was so much interested in SARM Institute that after one year of drop test uh, uh, competition, she applied for an internship for her studies because she wanted to engage in more research that is related to space applications. She spent around six months and she is very grateful for this opportunity that led to having the chance to work side by side with their engineering teams, which I showed you the picture at the beginning. Now, uh, the uh, other success stories. First, we were able to construct a 3D clinostat at the American University of Madaba in Jordan. Uh, we were able to mentor and advise many teams of high school students and to raise awareness about uh, outer space technologies. Then uh, also we uh, were able to uh, advise more teams into winning uh, national and international competitions. And last but not least, this week, uh, a team at the uh, American University of Madaba uh, won a 50,000 uh, euro grant for the Kleinostat that was uh, assembled at uh, AUM and in collaboration with the uh, uh, School of Medicine at Jordan University. And this is the photo of the group leader, Dr. Wajdi Awaidi. Thank you very much. And as uh, Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nabil, for your inspiring presentation. It is always nice to hear that an opportunity in drop test leads to so many um, different projects going in your country. So it's always a pleasure to hear this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I will move on to our fifth round drop test winner, who is Agota Seiman from Romania. I would like to ask all speakers to be mindful of their time since um, we do not have that much, but yes. Um, yeah, Agota, we can see your screen. I give the floor to you now. Uh, thank you, Hazuki, and for UNOSA's invitation. Hi, everyone. Today, I would like to provide you a brief insight into our drop test project from 2018. Uh, this project made uh, possible the, uh, for us to investigate the interaction of laser irradiated medicine droplets uh, with different uh, target surfaces under uh, short-term microgravity conditions. Two years ago, actually, on this exact day, we were reviewing our setup, making some last minute alignments, since on the next day, our very first experiment started at the Bremen drop tower at a gravitational acceleration comparable to one millionth of that encountered at Earth's surface. So you might ask, uh, how did we get to know about this opportunity? It's a funny story uh, how we found out the Drop Tower Experiment Series. At the beginning of 2018, I was participating at the hypergravity workshop organized to celebrate the first decade of the large diameter centrifuge at ISA, ESTEC. And there, Daniel Garcia Yarnos hold a presentation about the Human Space Technology Initiative activities of UNOSA. And a couple of weeks uh, after, the, after his presentation and after this workshop, um, uh, we received an email from him in which he told us that our research topic is very interesting and suggested a couple of open calls for project proposals. And one of them uh, actually was drop tests. 
I had uh, less than two weeks actually to, at that time to form a team and to write the project proposal. But I somehow I knew that this was a unique opportunity and I didn't want to miss it. And now I'm extremely happy that I had the courage and the energy to do it. Why we, did we apply to drug tests? We have already studied the interaction of laser irradiated medicines with different target surfaces in hypergravity conditions uh, within uh, ESA's In Your Thesis program. And actually, we always had in mind to continue this research in microgravity too. So the idea originates from that experience in hypergravity and also from our terrestrial studies carried out at the laser spectroscopy and the optics group of the National Institute for Laser Plasma and Radiation Physics uh, here in Romania. So probably you are also curious how has participating in uh, such a project and program changed the environment around us. First of all, uh, in the half year development phase, we have made progress in our scientific and technical knowledge. We have formed new connections too. Firstly, within our student team, because not all of us, uh, we knew each other. And secondly, with the uh, UNOSA and SARM experts. Following the project, I, I obtained an optics and photonics scholarship from SPIE and I am very grateful for the recommendation letters offered by my PhD coordinator, Professor Mihai Lucian Pascu, and the Deputy Scientific Director of CERN, Dr. Torben Koenemann. I, I also had the opportunity to present our project at different national and international conferences, obtaining the Best Student Presentation Award at uh, an international conference organized in my country. Last but not least, uh, actually this project led to new ideas and new project proposals, such as the one which I have proposed for the Orbit Your Thesis program of uh, ESA, alongside with uh, the nine member team and my PhD coordinator as an orbiting professor. Our team reached the finals, but after, unfortunately we didn't get selected. However, uh, later on, we have been contacted by an ESA representative to try to implement our idea into a new proposal. And now I am part of a new team uh, led by my professor, having a couple of old members, but also international collaborators. And uh, this new team is uh, going to develop a setup to be sent on board the International Space Station maybe one or one and a half years. So we are really enthusiastic about this new project. The subject uh, is a bit changed. Uh, we are not uh, going to study um, the interaction of droplets, medicine droplets with surfaces, but uh, we still have, we will have droplets, but uh, we will uh, try to investigate uh, how they are, uh, uh, actually they are coalescence. yes. So before I finish this presentation, I would like to share with you a couple of pictures from uh, Drop Test uh, 2018. Here is our student team while preparing the experiment. Uh, I also would like to show you some uh, photos from the control room because it was very impressive for me, especially when we were waiting uh, for the drop capsule to detach, it was really, uh, really interesting moment. <laughs> More pictures during setup installation and alignment, and and some funny moments too from this campaign. Finally, in the name of our drop test 2018 team, I would like to thank you for your attention support received from the following institutions and companies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agota, for your interesting presentation. It's really great to see that drop test led to new opportunities and new connections for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, 
Um, uh, before I move on to KiboCube, for drop test, we had a winner in the morning session from Costa Rica. So if you're interested in the presentation that he did, um, we will post all the information of the webinar, the presentations and the recordings probably next week on our website. So please make sure to check that out for Costa Rica. OK, next, before we um, go to Victor, who is the second round winner of KiboCube, I'd like to bring back um, the remarks from Mr. Glenn's TE at Yang, who is the second counselor of the permanent mission of Kenya. Kenya is the first round winner of KiboCube. So I'd like to give the floor to Mr. at Yang now. Allow me to begin by thanking the organizers of uh, this webinar, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, led by the director, Madam Simonetta de Pipo, for their untiring efforts to support developing countries' access opportunities in the space sector, and particularly the honor of inviting Kenya to give remarks and share our experiences. Our journey as a country began during the 58th session of COPUS in June 2015, when the Kenya delegation heard about the opportunity to be part of the project that will eventually lead the country to become a space actor. In 2016, the University of Nairobi, in collaboration with the University of Nairobi, submitted an application to benefit from the opportunity extended by UNOSA and the Japan Euros Eurospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, under the Kiboki program. This application was the first beneficiary, and we are proud of that. Courtesy of this opportunity, Kenya was able to develop and deploy to space its first space object, a nanosatellite christened first Kenyan University nanosatellite precursor flight on May 11, 2018, from the International Space Station. The launch of the first Kenyan satellite created a lot of excitement in Kenya, especially among the young people, because they realized that they too could essentially manage a similar or more advanced feat in their lifetime. More importantly, Kenya became a space-faring country. Ladies and gentlemen, participants, since that historic launch in 2018, Kenya has undertaken numerous steps to promote space activities in the country. Key among this was the establishment of the Kenya Space Agency in March 2017 to promote, coordinate, and regulate space-related affairs in the country. The agency has since developed and recently launched its strategic plan that will guide its focus for the next five years including strategies to promote the uptake in the utilization of space technology for planning and decision making. During the launch of the strategic plan in October this year, the agency also used the opportunity to award five beneficiary universities research grants valued at US dollars 10,000 each for nanosatellite development. This was informed by the need to continue building on the foundation of our first satellite launch of 2018. The five universities are expected to develop a model nano satellite with the aspiration of moving to a production of a launch model. We welcome support to this initiative. It is good to highlight here that the interest that came out of all this, some of the students are enthusiastic with space matters and have joined the Space Generation Advisory Council which brings together young professionals and students passionate about space from across the world. The Kenya Space Agency has also continued to organize numerous capacity building programs, which also raise awareness of space activities from the country. For example, in November 2019, the agency organized a hands-on training course on education program for technical advancement satellite development, which was offered by UNICEF Global with support from Nihon University in Japan. Participants from 10 local universities were taken through basic subsystems of satellite development, essentially the same process that is used to develop any satellite, laying off an important foundation for skills development on satellite technology. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the key challenges for any development country is the lack of requisite and adequately trained and skilled human capital in space science and technology, since it is a highly specialized field of study. Small satellite development, therefore, provides a unique opportunity and a cost-effective approach for any developing country to build its capacity. Kenya is keen to tap into the development of small satellites 
to build critical skilled human capital to spearhead the growth of our space industry. And we request for support and seek partnerships that will see us grow together. Another key challenge has been legislation, which is necessary for the governing of space activities. As we continue to enhance our engagement in space activities, we have realized the need for national legislation on space matters, which becoming more and more crucial. Thus, capacity building for space faring countries to develop national legislation within the context of the larger space law becomes a necessity. In this regard, I take this opportunity to applaud UNOSA for heeding the calls by developing countries made during the past STC sessions to organize capacity building platforms that target to help countries such as ours enhance their capacities in this respect. In concluding participants, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish to reiterate that space science and technology has the potential to ignite technological advancement in developing countries, such as advancement, such advancements could immensely benefit our countries in terms of building the requisite human capacity in space-related disciplines and promote social economic development. UNOSA could therefore consider new space-faring nations from the developing world, including Kenya, as hosts for future international symposiums on basic space technology. We believe such discussions in such platforms, particularly on how space can be used to support the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, will help put into perspective how we can all use space together to address the challenges that, that hinder nations from achieving sustainable development. Finally, thank you all for listening. And I believe in all these endeavors, will go a long way in anchoring the development and growth we have witnessed in our country and I believe in all the developing countries that have a nascent space industry leading to the reality of space to of access of space to all. I thank you so much. Thank you so much Mr. Etyang for the inspiring um, presentation. Um, we are very happy to see that Kibo Cube has led to so many opportunities and to the growth of Kenya. And our office really supports all the support we have from the government and the permanent missions. Um, we really would like to extend our thank you to the ambassador of the permanent mission of Costa Rica and the permanent mission of Jordan and Kenya for being here today. Thank you so much. Okay, I'd like to move on to our winner from Kibo Cube. Mr. Victor Hugo Ajodi Bardales, who is from Guatemala. Victor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, sharing my screen. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. My name is Victor Guayerdi. I work in Universidad Valle de Guatemala, and I will talk to you about our uh, CubeSat Quetzal 1 uh, uh, project. We started this project in 2014. In 2017, the CubeSat was selected as the winner of the second round of the CubeSat Cube program. And the mission of the CubeSat is to test a multispectral sensor prototype, introducing the aerospace field in, in Guatemala, developing human capital. Uh, supports the SDGs number 5, 9, and 17. Um, during the project, we have uh, about 100 persons involved. Uh, as I said, we started with a small team in 2014 for undergraduate students, which were most of the part of the team were students, but also we have uh, faculty, alumni, and external advisors that support us in, in this uh, journey. Um, you can see in this slide the evolution of uh, our design of the satellite from the first model in 2014 to the fly model that is currently operating in space. Um, it's important to mention that uh, when we started the project, we didn't have a budget. Uh, we, we were a, a, a few group of people that uh, just decided that uh, we could do a satellite and we could learn a lot in the project. So we started uh, basically learning and each year a group of uh, new students enter the, the team uh, working the, as, as their graduation project. So we work in that way several years and 
Uh, in 2016, uh, after the World Space Week, we knew about the Keep Keep program. Uh, that was a wonderful opportunity for us because uh, at that time, as I said, it was difficult for us. We didn't have a budget when we started. We also we didn't know how to do CubeSats or had experiences that so we don't have aerospace engineering programs in Guatemala. So when we knew about the Keep Keep program, we have learned uh, after working almost three years. Uh, learning about CubeSats, so we decided to apply um, and it was also a, a good opportunity because we, before KiboCube, uh, basically it was very difficult for us to have credibility in Guatemala about what we were doing, what we were plan planning to do, but after we were selected as the winners of uh, KiboCube, that uh, really changed. So we presented our application at the beginning of 2017 with the design that you see on the screen, we were selected as winners, and after that, we started working with JAXA to know about the documentation and requirements that we needed to comply to, to send the satellite to the International Space Station and deploy it from it. And that uh, happened this year, on March, the tubes that went to the ISS uh, on board the CRS-20 mission, and about uh, one and a half months after that, the satellite was deployed from the Kibo model of, of the ISS. Uh, both of these events were huge uh, events in Guatemala. We, we saw how people in Guatemala was really proud and motivated when this happened. Uh, both days uh, we see a lot of happiness in our country, which is uh, very nice uh, for us. And, and this is due to, to the Kibo cube because uh, when, when we uh, review how KiboQ uh, really changed the project and uh, had uh, impact in the change of environment here in Guatemala, we can see a lot of things. First, we, we, we can see how this dream of a small group of people became a historical achievement of a small country. As I said, uh, both days uh, of the um, uh, launch of the rocket that transport the the CubeSat and the deployment from the ISS were huge events covered for, from all the newspapers in Guatemala. And people were really, really happy about that. Uh, it uh, helped us to, to achieve our objective of develop uh, capacities and, and human capital. Uh, many of those students that were part of the project uh, have learned a lot of things that uh, they couldn't learn in class. Um, and they also have had a lot of nice opportunities, about 30% uh, um, of the members of the team have traveled abroad due to the project, some to workshops, some to conference, some of them uh, to do the tests uh, in the final tests that were done in Scotland. So that has helped uh, us a lot uh, uh, also. Uh, we, we designed uh, about 70% of the Sun models of the satellite, and those capacities are very good, not only for us, because uh, those capacities are available now in, in the region. We are talking with uh, two universities in the region to support them in the development or, or the, of their first cube sets of, of those countries. So that is something good that also led us this project. Uh, something that is important to mention that uh, uh, probably is, is hidden most of the time is that for developing the satellite you need a laboratory, we didn't have one, and you need a lot of tools, test rigs, uh, equipment, so uh, during the process we have to figure out how to solve that, uh, we transform a classroom into a laboratory, you can see in the image in, in the right side, we improvise a clean room that uh, was uh, functional, uh, it helped us for what was needed. We also had to do tests of the satellite uh, in the sun, so we need to figure out that uh, acrylic box that uh, protects the satellite from the dust. And we also had to, to build a, a lot of uh, simple things that are very useful, and, and those things uh, take you time when you are trying to, to, to see what you can do to, to do the tests that you need to do and you don't have the equipment. And what is nice is that uh, now the, that the satellite is operating in, in space, it has almost seven months there, uh, we, we have all these things in our uh, laboratory that used to be a classroom. 
and for sure they are going to be useful for for a second satellite that we we are planning to do in in, in the next years also uh, we have a, a big opportunity and is that when you are working in the first satellite of your country that is uh, something that really really can inspire future generations and uh, when we made our application uh, to KiboQ, uh, we put a section there that uh, said what we want, planned to do if, in case we were selected as winners. And we can comply with that. So we, we say that we will organize a competition to name the satellites among kids in Guatemala. We did that and Quetzal one was selected as the winner. The Quetzal is the national beer of Guatemala. We also did a competition to design the mission patch that you see on the corner in the right side. Um, we, we plan to do conferences in schools. We did that and we also uh, work workshops in schools when, where kids uh, can assemble a, a 3D printed CubeSat and learn about the parts of, of the CubeSat. And we didn't have planned that, but uh, during the process we, we decided to do it and we established a partnership with uh, Prensa Libre, which is one of the main newspapers in Guatemala. And we have a, a bi-weekly article that we work together with them during two years. We have a total of 55 articles, as the one that you see in the corner in, in the left side, uh, explaining all about the project and the CubeSat. So during two years, we were uh, publishing these articles and it was very nice for us to, to see, for example, kids in schools during the workshops that say, hey, I, I know that the CubeSat works in, in this way and we can see that they were reading the articles in the newspaper. So they, they really learned a lot about the project and knew uh, a lot of things of the CubeSat, not only of the launch and the deployment, which were uh, the most recognized events, but there was a lot of information before that that really helped uh, to motivate the uh, future generations and also to educate because they learned about a lot about CubeSats space and all these activities in general. And finally, um, the, the KiboQ program opened a big door for us and, and it was the, the way to establish partnerships in this field with uh, other institutions but uh, locally and internationally. Now we have a, a lot of contacts that supported us for, for the Quetzal One. We are working some projects in, in the space field with uh, several of, of these uh, organizations. And we also would like in the future, and I, I, I know we are uh, uh, going to apply for other opportunities uh, of the initiatives UNOSA in, in the short term. So, I, I really want to take full to UNUSA and JAXA for the KiboQ program. Uh, I can say that it really has a big impact in Guatemala and is something that I would recommend definitely to, to any country that wants to start in, in, in the space field. So thank you very much. Thank you for your inspiring presentation. I think there were so many um, really useful advices that um, applicants in the future can steal from this presentation. And yeah, it's really inspiring to see all the little efforts that were put into the testing and to the whole process. It really proves that everything is possible. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank you. Okay. So for KiboCube, in the morning session, we had a team from Mauritius and also a team from Sika, which is an uh, collaboration of an international, um, international group. And you can also see that in the pre presentations, which we will try to post hopefully next week. Okay, next, I'd like to move on to the speakers from the Chinese Space Station Opportunity. Um, this is a relatively new opportunity that we opened in 2018. We chose the winners in 2019. So this is the first round winners. So our first speaker is Merlin Reynard Kolb. His team is from Switzerland, Germany, and China. Merlin, you have this. Yes. Call. Okay, you can hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I will share my screen. It should also be visible now. Okay, great. So, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about the Polar 2 experiment. 
So Polar 2 is a collaboration between institutes in Switzerland, uh, Poland, Germany and China. I myself am from um, the University of Geneva in Switzerland. I'm the project manager of this project. And um, I will talk a little bit about the history of the Polar 2 project uh, to give a bit of insight of how this happened and how we got on the Chinese space station. Um, then um, why we need to be on the China space station and finally the current state of the projects and how things are progressing since we got this very nice opportunity. So to start uh, with the history of Polar 2, well, as the name suggests, Polar 2 is the successor of a mission that was called Polar, which was originally just a European mission, um, collaboration between Switzerland and Poland, uh, which was started in 2005, so a long time ago. And there, the idea was very simple. There were people who had a very good idea to do some interesting astrophysical measurements that had never been done before. They had the idea, they knew how to do it. They knew how to measure this thing. Uh, but what they required was a relatively small space-based detector, 30 by 30 centimeters, 25 kilos. And building this detector also is not that it's particularly difficult, but you need to find an opportunity to get it into space. So the Polar people, uh, back in that time when I was not yet involved, um, spent six years going past NASA, ESA, the Russian Space Agency, the Indian Space Agency, and finally after six years there was an agreement with the Chinese Space Agency, uh, who agreed to place Polar 1 on the Chang'e 2. Chang'e 2 was the second Chinese space lab, um, sort of the predecessor of the China Space Station. And um, when I joined in 2015, things were going a lot faster because the moment that there was a launch opportunity known and people knew this thing was actually going into space, people are a lot more motivated, things go fast and you have a goal to work towards. So when I joined in 2015, things were going fast and in 2016 we launched this mission um, successfully as part of Chang'e 2. We got very nice scientific results. Um, the mission ended in 2017, 18, roughly. Um, and since then, we don't really work on Polar anymore, but we still, we have the spare detector, which you, for example, can see in the bottom left, uh, which is now in a museum in China. Well, it's two or several museums in China, actually. So it's quite nice uh, as a thing to bring to the public. What we learned from Polar was that basically the thing that we wanted to measure, which I don't have time to go into detail to, but Basically, we want to measure something which is the polarization of gamma rays that come from very big explosions in the universe. And this polarization that we wanted to measure turned out to be much smaller than what, it, what we thought it would be, what the theoretical community thought it was. Which meant that with polar, it was difficult to see something, and we learned that we need an instrument which is 10 times more sensitive. Um, now, since all the things that we learned from building Polar, we knew that we could gain a factor two and a half to three by technological improvements, but still we needed to build something which was four times bigger than Polar. So almost one meter cubed of detector. So this is big um, and it's very difficult to find someone who can put this in space and who can meet all the requirements. So we started thinking about this in 2018 and then we were only looking around what we could do we were already talking to our old friends at the Chinese Space Agency. They didn't really have a clear opportunity for us to, to put it on the China Space Station, even though we knew it was gonna be an impossible opportunity. Um, but they did point us out that there was this very nice opportunity organized by UN OOSA, uh, where we could apply to put our instrument on the China Space Station. Now for us, this was completely ideal, first of all, because of our heritage with uh, the, the agencies. And secondly, because it's basically the only place where we can do this kind of mission. Because this Polar 2 instrument, uh, the minimum size we can get it to be is uh, 60 by 60 by 70 centimeters. So it's very big. It will be 150 kilos. It consumes 300 watts, um, produces 30 gigabytes of data per day. So all of this to do on a satellite mission or anything is extremely challenging and it costs you tens of millions, probably more. Um, we are, for example, aware of an experiment similar with the same science goal that is being developed by NASA, different groups in the US, and they have a collaboration of, I think, a hundred people uh, and a budget of tens of millions of dollars, uh, whereas we are a group of 10, 15 people and we work on uh, a significantly smaller budget. So 
basically what this allows us to when we can place this on the China State Station is that we can do very amazing science, like at least relatively uh, with a small group of people, and we can manage this on a short time scale. So, for example, our PhD student that we hired here a year ago, thanks to this opportunity, he will probably be able to see this thing launched even, which creates a lot more motivation uh, when working on a project. It's not really fun to work on a project that lasts for 15 years and you don't actually know if it's actually going to go anywhere. So this is one of the very nice things that we have. It's concrete. We know it will go into space. Uh, the moment you have a launch opportunity, when you know it will go into space, it's also much easier to find funding to actually build your detector. Because um, the moment that we got the great news that we were selected, we basically got the funding from at least the Swiss side practically the same day. Uh, that we could go out and start building things, that we could hire a PhD student, that we could hire uh, some technicians. So in Switzerland, we're going very fast now. We are building the prototype. Um, our colleagues in Poland and Germany and China are applying for the money they will in the next few weeks. Of course, there are some delays due to COVID, but we are really on schedule to get this thing into space in 2024. So we've already had many discussions with the agencies. We know exactly where we are going to be on the China Space Station now. Um, and we will start, we're currently in the states of the prototype um, studies and we will start building a full flight model next year and aim to finalize this in 2023 and then bring it there. And then soon after, we should be able to uh, take data for at least two years, maybe longer, and do some very interesting measurements with a small group of people in a relatively short time, um, which is only possible with, through this kind of project. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Merlin inspiring presentation it's really great to see that there's a lot of international cooperation going on and it's we're really excited to see the launch in 2024 and we're also really glad to see that everything is basically on schedule um despite all the COVID-19 um situation that is going on but it's really great to see looking forward to it thank you so much okay I'd like to introduce you to our last speaker who is Miss Trisha Lynn Luis LaRose? What is Kyalison? I just see some. <laughs> I just see squares. I don't see the symbols. I think we have a hot mic. I don't have the symbols on my system. I'd like to ask everyone to make sure to mute their um, microphones. Okay, I think we only have you, Trisha, so whenever you're ready. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Trish LaRose. I'm the principal investigator for uh, Tumors in Space. I'm based in Norway, and uh, this is a collaboration between Norway and the China Man Space Agency under the coordination of UNUSA. Um, included in my uh, team are 14 international collaborators from four different countries, including France, Belgium, the Netherlands, um, Norway, and then, of course, um, China. Of our collaborators, we have hundreds of years of combined experience, which is quite impressive, um, and more than 1,000 peer-reviewed scientific articles. So the question is, how did uh, we or I become familiar with um, this opportunity? And in fact, as a principal investigator, it, it, this project is really driven uh, by me. Um, so it's my research um, goals and hypothesis. And then the team, once the scientific goals were realized, began to form around that. Um, so at the time I had the idea for Tumors in Space, I was in fact a postdoctoral scientist at the WHO. Uh, the Agency for Cancer in Lyon, France. And I've been involved in the space industry now since 2008 uh, via the International Space University in France, uh, which is the only uh, university in the world that's dedicated solely to graduate education in space. So being within that WHO and UN construct, um, I was, of course, very familiar with the work of UNOSA. And simply by doing an environmental scan, I came across the website, which you see here, um, the orbital platform and the opportunity for for the uh, China Space Station, uh, and we simply um, applied. So why do we need this experiment? The fact of the matter is there is no cure for cancer. 
there's treatment, there's early detection, but there is no cure. And we are spending billions of dollars doing the same type of research over and over again. We're no closer to finding a cure, and we continue to treat our cancer patients with exceptionally toxic methods, including radiotherapy um, and chemotherapy. So there really must be another way. And it's my opinion that it is far too late to be thinking out of the box. It is time to think out of this world. And you can see here on this schematic, um, all previous cancer experiments in space have been conducted using two-dimensional cell lines, which is denoted here by the letter A. And if you follow this arrow um, to the right side of the screen, you'll see different um, biological models that are increasing in sophistication, sorry, for biological rele relevance, ending, of course, with uh, the human being. So we as a team are sending human organoids into space, depicted here by the letter B, which is by far the most physiologically relevant um, biosample ever used to conduct cancer research in space. In fact, organoids are so physiologically relevant that they mimic the structure and function of the host tissue. So we are now conducting the most complex, sophisticated cancer research experiment in space and the longest at a 31-day mission, where all previous experiments were on cell lines uh, for a maximum of 14 days. Um, what we're looking for is we're looking for the mutational signature of cosmic radiation and also to see if microgravity slows or stops the growth of cancer. Of course, this type of preparation requires years of groundwork um, this work has never been done, which means we must build um, our spaceflight hardware from scratch. And what's really unique about this opportunity is that the China Space Station is allowing and in fact is evaluating experiments based on the cutting edge or paradigm shifting nature. And so this opportunity really allowed us to push way outside of the box um, and to do something that had never been done before and to take a really big risk um, in doing that. So how has this changed the environment around me? I say here, it's okay to breathe free electron. When we're faced with doing something that is so bold and so innovative, something that has never been done before, there's a period of time that you're really free, almost without support. And it means as the principal investigator, I really had to be confident in my own scientific expertise and in my ability to attract and recruit the right team members so that we can get this um, really quite paradigm shifting research into space. And this is the first um, cancer research, uh, human biology research uh, ever conducted with the support of the Norwegian Space Agency. So certainly I see within our own country, um, the environment is changing, but also being from Norway, it means that all of our results have to be open access. We believe in open science, so this means that our research from a Norwegian perspective will not only benefit our country, but will be open and free to everyone around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trisha. It's really interesting to see what um, at, like cancer research that can be that relates to space. It's really inspiring. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I know we are over the time, but I'd like to start answering the questions in the Q&A. If any of you have more questions, please make sure to send them in the chat. Um, if you are interested and want to directly contact any of the people who have been speaking, um, as I mentioned earlier, we will post their presentations on our website, hopefully next week. And I, uh, I believe a lot of them have their um, uh, email addresses on their presentation, so maybe you can connect them direct, um, connect to them directly. Okay, so for the Q and A, I believe we had some questions about the application. So, who is able to participate and everything? So, basically, our opportunities in this initiative are open to member states of the United Nations. Um, some of the opportunities are more in particular to developing countries, but basically, if you are a member of the if your country is a member state of the United Nations, it is open for all. Um, for example, drop tests, um, there are some um, reg, uh, rules, not rules, there are some um, restrictions about um, if you have to have a master's degree or whatever. So it really depends on each um, program. So um, we have everything on our website. Please make sure to see them. Um, 
We also had a question about drop tests. So um, the next rounds we are under discussion right now. Actually, the rounds for this year that were supposed to happen, we had to extend it because of COVID-19. So probably the next round for drop tests will open maybe in the middle of 2021. We are still in discussion with our partners, um, ZARM and DLR. So we will post everything on our website. So please make sure to check that. And Yes, let's see some other questions. Okay, um, from Johannes, I was thinking, depending on the plant. Um, okay, hold on. Oh, this one, it, it's a comment. Okay, um, technical expertise is especially needed in these experiments. However, are there needs for foreign relations or international relations? Um, professionals to work on these projects to help more countries and agencies gain access to space. So definitely um, in the application process, um, I would say it is more technical because you would need to define your project and schedules and everything you need. However, um, as you can see in the examples from Guatemala, it is really important to have um, partners and it, it would be really nice to have um, people who are used to international relations because it is always nice to have international partners and also some understanding from the government and support from the governments. And yeah, um, a lot of the projects I see have um, different partners. So I think, yeah, it would be really beneficial to have international relations professionals. Um, I see Trisha raising her hand. Maybe do you have anything to add to this? Um, yes, I do. I actually think this is an excellent um, question. To be totally honest, one of the most challenging aspects of Tumors in Space has been the international collaboration. Um, as one person heading a team of 14 people, although there's four countries represented, that just means the collaborating institutions are in those four countries. The 14 team members are from all around the globe, plus China, plus the United Nations, several space agencies. And so the diplomatic relations, even just handling time zones, cultural competency, um, differences in communication styles, what is polite, what is not. Um, even for example, uh, when our Chinese collaborators are using uh, their last names as their first names, et cetera, et cetera. All of these types of, of international relation aspects are absolutely key to the success of this program. And no bilateral agreement, no consortium agreement, nothing can get signed until every single member of the team is in agreement. So absolutely, yes. Um, for example, project management roles or consultant roles or advisory board roles um, are certainly some areas where, where this type of expertise um, is needed. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Tricia. Um, maybe I can ask one of the team members if how important this international cooperation, international relationship part was. So maybe um, if any of you have any experience or comments on that. Um, maybe since there's a lot of cooper um, international cooperation in the Chinese space station, may I ask Merlin how he thinks of this one? Um, so the international collaboration part for us is, okay, the universities that we collaborate with is relatively straightforward because we all know each other and uh, that's quite simple. Of course, working with the Chinese Space Agency is quite different, um, but still it's usually technical discussions, etc. So that, that is not the most challenging thing. I would say the most challenging thing for the international part is, um, which we don't have experts on, but we would like to, is the exports and imports regulations, for example. So any kind of electronics that we need to ship to China, we cannot do it. Um, and we have to understand how, what we can buy, what we can, what we can import from China, what we can export to China. And all of this is very complicated. And for this to have experts would be great, but this is unfortunately, we don't have the budget for those kind of things. Um, that is a challenging part. Uh, the collaboration itself, I would say it's, it's Get tricky at times, but it's something that we can manage. Thank you so much, Merlin. Oh, I see Trisha with her hand up. 
Go ahead. Um, yes, thank you. Just one other comment, and then unfortunately I have to um, leave the, web the webinar. But um, I agree, Merlin, with what you're saying. In fact, one of our early investors in Tumors in Space was a technology transfer office at the University of Oslo, which means we have help with commercialization aspects, import export control, um, because this is really a specialty that no one on the team um, has. And this was an investment. Um, so yes, that is a crucial component as well. So I, I think Justin, just to reiterate that all of these administrative, um, legal policy communication aspects are absolutely key to the success of, of international collaborations, particularly among space agencies and particularly in collaboration between a, such a diverse range of um, countries who have very different uh, political structures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trisha. Maybe I can ask also Victor, since he, I know you have worked with so many different partners from so many different countries. If there's anything you can add about that? Yes. Um, well, um, I recommend that uh, you can participate in, in events like this webinar where you uh, know about people that are working in space. Uh, UNUSA has also uh, other type of events uh, normally in the year, so I would recommend to, to be pending on them. Uh, I have made uh, several of the contacts uh, through, through those uh, opportunities. And, and you can find uh, that uh, a lot of people working in, in the space field uh, needs to work with, with other partners, other countries. So I'm sure that those are uh, points of contact that uh, can help to, to start those um, uh, partnerships. Uh, in our case, we, we didn't know how to, to do CubeSats when we started, so we, we started looking for partners and you also found people that uh, uh, once uh, in the same position as you in the past, so uh, like us, we, we were we willing co to collaborate and also uh, support as we received support from other partners. Thank you so much, Victor. I'd like to ask everyone this question. So maybe um, Agota, do you have any um, international cooperation and all the other skills that could help? Uh, in our team, we were only Romanian team members. Uh, the international collaboration was uh, with uh, UNOSA and uh, SARM uh, members which was uh, really straightforward in our case. And, and of course, it was really great opportunity to connect uh, with these people. And, and yes, I, but I, I would like uh, for the future, I think it would be really interesting to, to work on projects at uh, even more international level, like in the case of this um, this new project, which is just ongoing, uh, for which we have um, uh, German and um, American collaborators. So we are really enthusiastic about it. Thank you, Agota. And may I ask Nabil the same question? Well, uh, to us, uh, it's very important to have such activities it promotes peace in the whole world, it promotes uh, tolerance, it promotes uh, collaboration among nations, and uh, this is very much needed in this uh, time of crisis across the whole globe. Thank you. Thank you, Nabil, and thank you to all the winners for their answers. Um, I do not see any more questions in the chat right now. So I think we are able to end this webinar. So I'd like to extend my um, appreciation to all the people who participated, especially to the speakers. It was really great to hear your stories and I hope everyone is influenced and it was, I think it was a positive message to future applicants. So thank you to all. Um, to all the people who were listening in, joining please make sure to answer our questionnaire form um, it would be really wonderful to have feedback from you and um, we want to uh, make our webinars better and useful for everyone so it would be great to hear your voices 
And of course, we can send you information about further webinars and also um, the activities of our office. So please make sure to answer our questionnaire form. So yes, thank you so much. Um, as Jorge mentioned, we will have another webinar next week. So please make sure to check out our whole series of webinars. And yeah, I hope to see all of you there soon. So thank you so much. And to all the speakers, I'd like to take a little photo. So if you can turn on your cameras and smile at the camera, that would be great. So if all the speakers could just turn on be great. We have a Erlen or is Mr. Alvarado here? Okay, maybe not. Okay, so everyone smile to the camera. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Others will Photoshop everyone and make it all pretty, so no worries. Thank you so much to everyone for participating. We really appreciate all of your support. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a nice all day. Right. Okay. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye